Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to reimagine Yom Kippur. If you are not Jewish, you might be thinking, I don't know much about Yom Kippur, so why would I be interested in reimagining it? I'm hoping to pique your curiosity. If you are Jewish and know a bit about Yom Kippur, I'm hoping to blow your mind. Let's begin. If you don't know about Yom Kippur, the first thing to know is that it is not a holiday. I know it's called a holiday a lot, but it's not a holiday. It is a holy day, and holy simply means set apart. Different from all other Jewish holidays, instead of feasting, we fast. And we don't just kind of fast. No, we have to take it to the extreme. Instead of, of no food or limiting our food, we have no food and no water. And we don't just do it for 24 hours. No, we do 25 hours to make sure we've done the whole day. It's a day filled with dread and fear. It is the holiest day of the year for Jews, extremely important, and a severely solemn day of fasting, introspection, confession, repentance, it's a very somber tone. This tone begins 40 days earlier and culminates on Yom Kippur. A traditional descriptive summary of Yom Kippur, and these are not my words, this is a quote, to stand before the king of kings in judgment in a court of law that this king has convened and confess our shortcomings while our king decides what will happen to us in the coming year. And as we plead with our king for a good year, and asked to be written in the book of life, we can't help but consider whether we truly deserve this and how we can become more deserving of it in the future." End quote. If that sounds ancient and archaic and as if it were written several centuries ago, let me tell you that I just received this in an email from a very well-known and esteemed rabbi in Britain just three days ago. This is the modern customary understanding of Yom Kippur in the here and now, even among those who are more contemporary in their practice. I wanted to share that with you because these archaic notions of standing before a divine king who judges whether we are even deserving of another year are the thoughts which will play out in the heads and hearts of millions of Jews around the world for the 25 hours of Yom Kippur beginning here at sunset tonight. Yom Kippur is no holiday. Especially given that Yom Kippur did not start like this, I find this to be sadly heartbreaking. Moreover, neither the historical context nor the focus of Yom Kippur services are based on an actual understanding of the Hebrew words which are used as the foundation for Yom Kippur. While many will assert that the history and rituals of the day are based on tradition, I would like to point out that the English word tradition was originally used in Roman law to refer to legal transfers and inheritance. Let's consider that for a minute. When you buy a new house or you get a new condo or move into a new apartment, do you keep it exactly as it was by the previous owner or resident? Or do you spend time, effort, and money on making it your home? Perhaps you landscape, you paint rooms, you add on, you make twe tweaks and improvements, you bring in furniture, maybe you even buy a new piece of furniture because you need it in the new space. And updates, boy, with the updates, always the updates. Jason and a few of us were having a discussion before the service about needing to update our air conditioners in the very near future. Tradition would tell us we need to do that, not that we need to hang on to the way it is without changes. So too must we do when traditions are handed down to us, even religious ones. To keep them as they've always been means, well, some of us would not even have indoor plumbing. We call that preservation, and things which are preserved in that manner, manner are locked away and displayed in muse museums. That's preservation. That's not honoring a tradition. So clearly, we must take religious traditions that have been passed along to us and update them in a way that is rational and reasonable for our use in the now. Yom Kippur, I believe, 
is long overdue a complete home renovation, most especially if we look back to its original meaning. The word kippur is usually translated as atonement, but this is an English translation of a Hebrew word that never meant that. It, it really means to cleanse or to decontaminate. De we find that originally there was an annual ritual performed to cleanse the sanctuary from any accidental ritual impurity that might have happened over the year. And this temple cleansing ritual was to be repeated annually on the 10th day of Tishrei, which is, happens tonight at sundown, the exact date on which Yom Kippur is marked to this day. Furthermore, an annual temple cleansing was not invented by the Hebrews. There were such rituals in the ancient Near East long before the Hebrews, including a temple cleansing rite observed by the Akkadian and Babylonian peoples. It was not only a part of the Babylonian New Year, just like the modern Jewish Yom Kippur, but the Babylonians also called this annual temple cleansing ritual, listen carefully, Kupuru. We must note the similar sounding and nearly identical spelling of the Hebrew word Kippur. Most scholars believe that actually that's where the Hebrew word Kippur came from, the Babylonians. So the Hebrews did not invent the day of Kippur, and its beginning was a simple cleansing of the temple once a year. And if the Hebrews did not invent it, if we borrowed the original Yom Kippur from the Babylonians, that makes it a day which is open for all of us, not just the Jews. And rather than atonement, which is a much later addition, it was simply an annual temple cleansing before so much more got layered onto it. There are three really important Hebrew words around which the entire day of Yom Kippur centers. These three words, Juva, Tefila, and Sadaka, have been translated into English as repentance, prayer, and giving to charity. The entire 24 hours of Yom Kippur is filled with emphasis on and focus on these three actions. But guess what? These three Hebrew words are most likely misunderstood and mistranslated, which would make a big difference in their application to this day of Yom Kippur. In other words, the Hebrew word tshuva is not repentance, tefillah is not prayer, and sadaka is not charity. If there's any Jewish people here, did I blow your mind yet? I hope I did. Juva, allegedly meaning repent. However, we have an entirely different Hebrew word for repent. Juva means to return. To what do we return? We return to home base. What is our home base? Our home base is our inherent goodness to rediscover and uncover the goodness which has always been within us. Real tshuva, return, calls us to unburden ourselves from guilt, embrace our core goodness, and let that goodness inspire our actions going forward. This is very different from repentance. I think you will agree. Tefillah, usually translated as prayer, infers to request or beseech something from someone. Again, there is a different Hebrew word for that, and it is not tefillah. Tefillah is an unusual word, and there are, in the Jewish way, of course, at least three opinions as to the real meaning of the Hebrew. It could mean to fall, it could mean to attach oneself to something or someone, or it could mean, in more likelihood, I think, to assess oneself. This self-assessment is not a harsh judgment. It's similar to a business taking inventory of its stock on hand. What does the store have plenty of? What might be missing from its shelves that we need more of? In a similar way, Tefillah asks us to discover and uncover our true and good core essence by realistically taking stock of ourselves. And finally, we look at the word Zdaka, commonly translated as charity. Again, you guessed it, got a pattern going on here. There is a different Hebrew word for charity, and it's not tzedakah. Tzedakah means willful, intentional righteousness as an obligatory duty. We do a righteous act because we must, because it's the right thing to do. The Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg of blessed memory was by all counts a tzedak, a person of righteousness. 
because she did what was the right thing to do. Now, don't get me wrong, giving charity from a generous heart is definitely always a good thing to do. I'm not knocking that. My point here is that it is not what we are asked to do on Yom Kippur in order to avert a decree, if we even believe that part of it. <clears throat> Just two more important Hebrew words can help us today in our understanding of Yom Kippur. We're almost done with the Hebrew. I promise I'm going to make it easy. The first word is the word Torah. Many translate Torah as commandments or laws, but its literal meaning is teaching or to aim, as in aiming an arrow. And if we're talking about a day of atonement, we should also consider the Hebrew concept of sin. <clears throat> It, the Hebrew concept of sin dovetails into our word Torah because the word for sin is also an archery term, meaning to miss the mark. It is not a state of being. One is not or cannot be born sinful, although some religions do hold that concept. And perhaps most importantly, sin is not a debt that needs some form of repayment. And that is exactly what Yom Kippur, looking at it as the wrong view of being a day of atonement, is asking us to do. Rather, in the Jewish concept, we are all born inherently good. Missing the mark, like an archer might miss the bullseye on the target, is the Jewish understanding of sin. Nothing more than that. If we are inherently good, but simply missing the mark, this gives us an entirely different but important perspective on atonement. Judaism's primary concern is to make the process of, of personal growth deliberate and intentional and aimed in a particular direction, which is why there's a heavy rel reliance on archery terms for concepts such as Torah and sin. Since Torah means to aim in a particular direction and sin is missing that mark, we need to ask, in one particular direction are we aiming? Is it some big absolute truth? perhaps a state of perfection? Or could it be something else? Let's explore. To start, let's recall the video of the shofar, the ram's horn being blown that we heard this morning. The shofar is important in our preparation for, and during these days, we call the High Holy Days. The purpose of the shofar blast is to wake us up, to disturb our status quo. You might recall that you heard three different shofar calls. There was a stable blast, then in the middle, there was a staccato blast. And then finally, there was a very long final blast. The one in the middle, the series of the quick staccato blast, that is a broken shofar call. And we call that one shavarim. The word shavarim literally means broken or shattered. Now, why would this be important? We're supposed to listen to the shofar every day for like 40 days. Why would we listen to that broken staccato call, which means shattered? Because we confuse being holy and righteous and deserving with being perfect. Humans are created as both inherently good and inherently broken. The staccato shofar call reminds us that in the new year ahead, instead of trying to make our broken parts whole and perfect, the real challenge of Yom Kippur is to find within our brokenness that which is most holy to find holiness within the broken and imperfect. As with most religions, the driving concern of Judaism is personal transformation. So in answer to our question, in what particular direction are we aiming? We can confidently affirm that all of the circumstances and imperfections and brokenness of our lives can be seen as pathways for our growth, not pathways to perfection. In other words, our target is to become wise, not perfect. Being wise is different from just knowing things, as it contains an element of discernment, kindness, compassion. That is the mark we are trying to hit. And how does the Torah aim us in that direction? The Jewish Bible, if you're familiar with it at all, has no perfect people in it. All of the stories are about really flawed and broken humans making mistake after mistake after mistake. Those stories show us what we're aiming for and that we're aiming for wisdom, learning from our mistakes, growing 
in wisdom despite or even because of our imperfections. We're aiming for wisdom, not perfection. We are to learn from the stories and develop into wise people. We do not aim for perfection, nor search for some absolute truth. Sacred texts of many religions, not just Jewish, all try to point us towards developing wisdom. We are broken, but we can become wise. This means that Yom Kippur is a day of cleaning out our temples by assessing ourselves realistically, seeing we are flawed, but inherently good. We measure ourselves not against a standard of perfection, but by the standard of becoming wiser and becoming righteous because we choose to do the right things. Brokenness does not mean we are undeserving, unworthy, and not good enough. It merely means we're human. Most of us don't like to think of ourselves as being broken. I didn't. I felt shame about being broken. But brokenness is part of being human, so there's no shame in it. Before you think of brokenness as something not very applaudable, let me ask you this. Have you heard of the Jamaican sprinter Usain Bolt? He's an Olympic legend who's been called the fastest man alive. Let me tell you a bit about him. He has obliterated world records and won multiple gold medals at the 2008, 2012, and 2016 Summer Games, holding multiple records through the years. No one else has come close to the sprinting he can do. Scientists, of course, have studied his running in an effort to understand how Bolt could run so darn fast. They wanted to know his secret sauce so it could be taught and developed in others, of course. But that's not what they discovered. They found something completely unexpected. Bolt's stride is dramatically uneven. His left foot stays on the ground 14% longer than his right. Conventional science asserts that an uneven stride slows a runner down. And what's more, Bolt's irregularity comes from a fundamentally unbalanced body. Severe scoliosis curved his spine and made his right leg half an inch shorter than his left. Could it be that his imperfect body is the secret of his superhuman speed? As we know, many of the greatest artists, musicians, and thinkers of all time had something materially flawed about them. Beethoven wrote his finest symphonies while going deaf. Virginia Woolf expanded our conception of literature, and Vincent van Gogh our way of seeing color, while they both struggled with severe depression. Yet the genius and superhuman prowess of these people did not necessarily come despite their pain or imperfection or disability. It may well have de derived precisely from and because of their brokenness. Jewish sages and mystics throughout the centuries would say that every one of us is an unfinished broken vessel. Too often we see our broken edges as deficiency, weakness, vulnerability. But what if the cracks in our own lives are what enables us to find our light, just like Usain Bolt? Let me tell you a true story. This is about a great artist who escaped to Paris with her husband just three days before the Nazis invaded Holland. They were able to take a boat to Caraco, where they lived many years. They ran their own art and antiques gallery in Caraco, and many of the customers were quite wealthy, coming to the shop from the cruise ships that stopped there. On one occasion, a very rich woman came ashore from the cruise ship and into the shop. She asked the shop owner, Suzanne, whether she had any shoes for sale from the famous French designer, Monsieur Damage, because she had a pair she loved and they fit so perfectly, she absolutely must buy more shoes from this designer. Well, Suzanne didn't have any Monsieur Damage shoes, and furthermore, she'd never even actually heard of Monsieur Damage. So she said to the woman, could I actually see a shoe, and maybe I'll find someone in Caraco who could get some for you. So the cruise ship woman removed a shoe from her foot and handed it to Suzanne. Suzanne carefully looked it over, looking here and there. She finally turned it upside down. There on the sole, she saw something written. And that's when it clicked. Written on the sole of the shoe was the word damaged. Over time, the D 
of damaged had worn off. And so to her, it looked like a French designer's name, Damage. In other words, it was a defective shoe with a fault in it that had clearly been sold at a reduced price. Yet, she loved it so much and it fit her so well that she had traveled halfway around the world to find another pair by that designer which would fit her feet as perfectly as these had. To everyone else, that pair of shoes were flawed and damaged goods, but to her, they were special. They were exclusive. They were precious. They were mon cher damage. This is where the traditional observance of Yom Kippur fails to take us. Aren't we all too often aware that we're damaged goods? We have faults, we have flaws, we have failings. We beat ourselves over them and beg for atonement and resolve over and over to do better, to be better. But what if we were capable of that paradigm shift where we could see ourselves as specially designed by Monsieur Damage? Suppose our failings were actually our strengths. Suppose our inability to do X was actually an ability to do Y, just like that pair of shoes or the sprinter Usain Bolt. Perhaps then the real work of Yom Kippur is to simply clean our temple, to clear out the negative self-image, which sometimes prevents us from doing the good we actually could do if we weren't so busy being negative and self-recriminating more worried about being worthy of being written into the book of life for another year than simply getting down to the business of writing ourselves into the book of life. While it is not entirely within our power to determine how we are broken, it is within our power to determine how we experience what life brings us and what we do with the time, abilities, and limitations we are given, even as they change and shift throughout the years, which they do and they will. Returning to our core essence, assessing ourselves in a balanced way, and choosing to do what is right, all of these do make a difference because they change us and how we live each and every day of our lives. They help us write ourselves into a life worth living. On this holy and fearsome day in the Jewish year, one of the most traditional prayer poems which will be sung tonight is called Unetena Tokef. It's about declaring the sacred power of this day because it is it a day that is full of dread. It's a terribly negative poem with a very sketchy history, but in the words of Tevier in Fiddler on the Roof, it is traditional. I believe it's time for us to embrace a rewrite of the observance of Yom Kippur, a re-understanding of the real meaning of the words Tfila, tzedakah, and teshuva, and also to rewrite the traditional Unetena Tokef prayer poem. I will close my message today by sharing an alternative version of it, and it's okay that you don't know the original. I think you can understand what I'm trying to, to get at. On Rosh Hashanah, it is written, on Yom Kippur, it is sealed, that this year, People will live and die, some more gently than others. We write our own book of life. Our actions are the words in it, and the stages of our lives are the chapters. Every deed counts. Everything we do matters. And we never know what tiny act or word will leave an impression or tip the scale. How many will seek joy in this world? How many will pass it by? Who will live and who will languish? Who will focus on what they have lost? And who will find ways to celebrate the life they have? Be it by laughter, by matzo balls, by ice cream sundaes, by walking in nature, or perhaps by long car drives counting deer. Who by connecting on Zoom? Who will dwell on the negative and who will express gratitude? Who will live their life fully in the midst of radical and global uncertainty? Who will stay hopeful in the face of darkness? And who will make meaning out of the chaos and randomness of it all? Who will? We will. We who turn again toward our core essence of goodness and doing what we know is right, 
who revel in the knowledge that life is precious, that we do not know how many moments we are given on this earth. We who tend to those things which can be tended and not get hung up on our brokenness, but embrace our inherent goodness and the perfection within our imperfections. This is how we declare the sacred power of this day and indeed of every day. May it be so. Amen.